Well, good morning. What a beautiful day. What a lovely time to gather together and worship the Lord on this Palm Sunday. So as we come, let's just take a breath because it's been a busy week, right? We have different kinds of experiences in these weeks, and some of us have a lot of weight on us, and some of us, things are just clicking on all cylinders, and that's great, but we come with a variety of needs, expectations, and as we gather to worship the Lord, let's trust that God has what we need. So I invite you to pray with me as we continue in our worship this morning. Loving and gracious God, thank you. Thank you for life, for love, for grace, for peace. Thank you for what you've done, what we celebrate today. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you have yet to do and which we continue to anticipate. Help us to trust you. And now, Lord, as we come together today, would you help us in our worship? Open our eyes and our ears that we'd be attentive to you, that we'd notice you, that we would move closer to you, the one who loves us, the one who saves, the one who cares. Praise be to your holy name. Amen. Let's sing together. And as you're finding your seat, would you turn to someone nearby and give them a greeting? We're here on this Palm Sunday to worship the Lord, to worship the King, the one who entered Jerusalem, and uh, we commemorate that day today. Part of our worship involves our offerings as we return with thanksgiving, a portion of what God has given us into the work that God calls us to do. So if you've come prepared today with an offering, the ushers will be passing plates in a moment. If you uh, give online, that's fine too. If you have something else going on, other ways that you support the work of the Lord, then let's continue to be people who give thanks to God for the provision that God offers us. 
And let's trust that these funds are used in ways that bring glory to his name. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the way you pour out so much into our lives. Thank you for the rich blessings we have, the spiritual blessings, the relational blessings, the material blessings. And now as we bring these gifts, God, may they be used for your glory. Amen. Please be seated. One part of our worship together is praying with and for one another, which is uh, an extension of the prayers that we do on our own. We can pray at home and wherever we are at work, on our way to work. But when we gather together as people who are seeking the Lord, prayer is an important part of our time together. As we remember the Lord's faithfulness, as we lift before the Lord those who have significant needs. And so many of us in this room could give testimony to what has happened because people have prayed for us. And so many in this room could give testimony of ways that they have been faithful in prayer and seen God at work. So in both of those ways, we are encouraged to continue praying with and for one another. I invite you to join me now as I lead us in this time. Lord, thank you for your good work in and around us and in and around this world. As we lift our voices in prayer now, we want to follow the lead you give us in the scriptures and through your people. Praying for government leaders, and all the complexities that they face, all the competing interests they need to address. We pray, God, that these people would seek you, that they would pursue the peace and the justice that you make possible and that would be honoring to you. We pray for your church. We thank you, God, that your church is large and broad. We thank you for the many local expressions around the world and in our own neighborhood. And we pray for the continued courage of your people and the clarity in their lives to bear witness to your grace and goodness. We pray for this church, 
We thank you, God, for what you've given us so far. And pray, Lord, that in your mercy you would give us opportunities still to continue serving one another and our community. That you would open our eyes to ways of using the resources with which you've blessed us to carry out the work to which you call us. We pray for the people we know, family members and friends, people at work, at school, people in our neighborhoods, in our various networks. God, we're aware of pressures and situations. We know some who are rejoicing and some who are weeping, some who are waiting. And we pray for these people. We pray for healing. We pray patience. We pray strength. We pray insight. Lord, we pray for ourselves. We pray that we would be attentive to what you're doing, to what you're saying, to what you're asking of us. That we might be mindful of ways that we get distracted. That we would be quick to return. That we would be growing in our awareness of and our allegiance to you. And we thank you, Lord, that you hear us. We thank you that you love us, that you love the people around us. We thank you that you continue to be at work in this world. And we bring our praise and our thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, choir. That was beautiful. Beautiful. This morning's scripture is from John chapter 12, verses 12 to 19. You can be found on page 1532 of your Bible in your pews if you'd like to follow along. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him, and these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. This is the word of the Lord. And as we look into your word, Lord, we pray that you'd guide us through it by your Holy Spirit, that you'd speak to us in ways we can understand and keep drawing us into the life that you make possible. Amen. So a few days after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and by the way, that's a great story. It's conveyed in chapter 11 of John's gospel. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. It's just over the hill from where Lazarus and his family was living. Like every other Jewish male, Jesus wants to be in the city of Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, one of these annual festivals that attracted people from all over. But unlike others around him, Jesus is entering the city as the one prophets since the time of Moses had anticipated. Jesus is coming to Jerusalem as king. Now, you would hardly conclude that just by looking at him. I mean, yes, he's got an entourage, but it's small. Yes, he's riding, not walking, but it's on a donkey, not a horse, the kind of horse like you see in the statues or the art of this period. But still, he's a king. For more than a thousand years, the prophets had been saying that God would send a deliverer and each generation since then had been asking, is it now? Is it him? Several had been identified as that deliverer along the way over the years. In fact, even in Jesus' lifetime, a few had risen up, but they came to nothing. That did nothing to, in, to dampen enthusiasm, however, because people continued to believe that one was coming to deliver, so they thought from those who were in control of the land, whether it was Persia or Greece or Rome. So when Jesus shows up as a young man moving around the countryside, preaching, teaching, and healing, talking about God in ways that people hadn't done really prior to this, people were talking. And the speculation was rising, could this guy be that guy? In the sixth chapter of John's Gospel, we read about how a group wanted to make Jesus king by force. They were convinced this was our guy. This is our moment. But Jesus walked away from that grassroots effort to put a crown on his head, which was strange, right? I mean, he's a king. He's come to deliver. Yeah, that's true. But his approach was going to be different from what so many 
expected. His purpose was not simply to defeat an earthly power, in this case Rome, but rather the forces of the evil behind every expression of darkness, which had as its weapons sin and death. What would that take? What would that look like? Jesus leaves Bethany, the town where Lazarus and his sisters were living. He goes over the Mount of Olives. He comes down into the Kidron Valley and then walks up into the city of Jerusalem. Disciples are with him. He's preceded by a reputation. People already that are filling the city are starting to ask, wait a minute, something's, what's going on? What's, what, there's a guy? Who's this guy? Who is this guy? And word spreads, he's coming, he's coming. So the people gather outside the gate of Jerusalem. They pull branches off trees. They lay their coats down on the ground. And Jesus is riding now. He's on a donkey, but only puts him at eye level with everybody else. And people call out, Hosanna. It's a word that's co-opted from other portions of the scriptures that typically is raised when people are in trouble, especially from outside forces like uh, other countries who rule over them. Hosanna, oh, save us now. It's more of a political word. And then blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Here they're quoting the Psalms. They've picked up somehow one of the Psalms that has this idea, and they use it as their own. It's a song. It's a tune that they can sing out. It's part of what is being expressed by the crowd. And then there's a third line. Blessed is the king of Israel. This is not from the Bible. This is something they came up with on their own that people were kind of passing around among them. Blessed is the king of Israel. Now, to be fair, that's got a biblical root to it. God was planning to set up a kingdom. Jesus talked about that kingdom in many of his parables. Years later, John, with the benefit of hindsight, would be able to go back into scriptures and remember what, uh, what Zechariah had said. Don't be afraid, daughter Zion. Look, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. It's a little bit deeper here in chapter 12. But in this moment, in this moment, it's most likely that the crowd is thinking, today is the day our king sets up his throne and takes Rome down. Except that Jesus was not that kind of king. One way that John shows that is by shifting the focus of the action away from this, what we call, triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Very swiftly, he moves us to another scene in verse 20. He talks about, John is talking about some Greeks who were among those who had come to Jerusalem to worship for the festival of Passover. They came to Philip, one of Jesus' followers, and had a request. We would like to see Jesus, they say to Philip. So Philip goes to Andrew, and Andrew and Philip tells Jesus. And Jesus, you'd think if he was trying to gather a crowd, it's like, great, the more the merrier. But instead, he replies, very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed, which sounds pretty enigmatic, right? It's like, wait a minute, these guys want to come and see you. You've just had this triumphal entry. People are calling out about be being a king, and you're talking about a seed falling into the ground to die? What is that? Verse 27 he opens it up a little further. What shall I say? My soul is troubled. Shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. He's got a very different thing going through his mind than what the people who have been calling out, blessed is the king of Israel, have in theirs. And then down to verse 31 of chapter 12, Jesus says, Now is the time for judgment on the world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And then John throws in his comment on that line by saying, Jesus said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. And now we're at the heart of it. 
because this one who has come to the accolades of people calling out for a king is saying, yeah, I'm a king, but a king in this way, a king who is willing to die. And this is not a good career move. How can his death be helpful to people who want to be released from the power of Rome? And yet for Jesus, death is essential. It is the means by which life happens. It is necessary for the defeat of the true enemy. Not the temporary enemy, but the true enemy. In chapter 13, John gives us one more scene to help us understand what kind of a king Jesus is. And in chapter 13, we read about how Jesus has gathered his friends for this Passover meal. They are in an, a room off by themselves. Jesus is the host of this dinner. It is the kind of meal that has been happening once a year for more than a thousand years. Every Jewish family goes through this. Everybody knows the script. Everybody is delighted and excited about being together for this celebration. And when Jesus gathers his friends, they come with anticipation as well. Now, one of the things that would happen by custom when you came to someone's home for a meal, especially a special meal like this, is that you would be given some hospitality when you first walked in. Do you remember how, do you remember how when you were growing up, your mother would say before a meal, have you washed your hands? Right? That was just customary, right? Because if you were a kid back then, you were out playing in the dirt. You weren't tapping on a cell phone or at a computer screen. You were out playing in the dirt. And so your mom had to say, wash your hands before you eat. In a Jewish custom, if you came to someone's home for a meal, it wasn't wash your hands. It probably was wash your hands. But it was also, have you washed your feet? Because the roads were full of dirt. And when you came into a house, it was nice to be clean. So typically, one of the house servants would take care of that for you. If you were a guest coming in, one of the servants would have you sit and would wash your feet. When the disciples come to this room where Jesus is hosting this meal, they look around. There's no servant in this room. And they look around a little more, and what they discover is here's Jesus picking up the basin and the towel and going around to each one in the room saying, have a seat, let me... Let me help. And he washes their feet before this meal. What kind of a king is Jesus? He's a king who is willing to die. He is a king committed to serving. Let this sink in. As we move towards Easter, as we go through Palm Sunday and on into Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, and the quiet day of Saturday, as we prepare to celebrate the resurrection, consider this one who we remember, this one who is at the center of all of this attention. He is more than a nice guy. He is more than an effective teacher. He's even more than a wonder worker. This is the one that God has sent to rescue and deliver, not from a political overlord, but from the full force of evil. This is the king whose reign has begun, the king who one day will fully and finally rule over all. This is the king who is willing to die so that that can happen. This is the king committed to serve so as to show what lies at the heart of God who calls people into a particular way of life. And the question that this story, like so many others, raise, raises, is he a king for you? Is he a king you would follow? Because that's the invitation. When the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw all to himself, Jesus says. That's the invitation to see, to serve, to trust, to align with this King.
to let go of other options, other possibilities, and say yes to what he offers and to keep saying yes to what he asks. Let's pray. We're grateful, God, for these records left by John and others that tell us about days like this day of entry into Jerusalem. And we're thankful for the teaching of Jesus and the example of Jesus and the work of Jesus, the faithful work of Jesus, willing to go through it all so as to establish a kingdom that could not, that would not be overtaken, a kingdom able to defeat every power, every authority, a kingdom where life is possible and good. And as we see this king, as we encounter this king, oh God, Would you open our eyes? Would you ready our hearts to receive him as king, to welcome him as king, to serve him as king, to walk with him as king? Praise be to your holy name. That Passover meal that Jesus was celebrating with his disciples would become what we now call the communion or the Eucharist as the bread and cup are brought from that Passover into a celebration of those who call Jesus Lord. It is for us a reminder of what Jesus did, of how far he was willing to go. It is a focal point for us to consider this one who gave himself on our behalf. And so as we come to the table of the Lord now to remember the Lord through the cup and through the bread, we want to pause for a moment or two to lift our thanks, to also open our hearts before the Lord and recognize ways and times that we drift away from him. And then to seek the Lord's help to give the Lord praise, to offer our thanks. The prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, the one we commonly call the Lord's Prayer, is a good way for us to wrap all of those ideas together. So as we pray that prayer now, let's move through it slowly. Let's reflect on what it opens up for us. And let's use this time to ready our hearts for remembering the Lord through the communion. And so we come to you in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
In a moment, trays will be passing through the pews and you'll find bread in one set and then after it, a cup. If you will take the bread, if you're participating this morning, take the bread and hold it so that we can eat together. And we'll do the same in a few moments with the cup. For this bread and for this cup, for what they say of you, how they point us to you, for the way they speak. We give you thanks. We're grateful for the one who came, the one who died, the one who rose again. And we remember him now with grateful hearts, asking your blessing on this time through Christ our Lord. Amen. When Jesus broke bread, he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, it's broken for you. As you eat it, remember me.
Jesus took the cup that was on the table, passed it around among his disciples. This is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins, for the possibility of life. And so as you drink, remember me. You'll find a prayer in your program that we'll use to draw this time to a close. And I invite you to pray with me. We thank you, God, for inviting us to this table where we remember the Lord. We thank you for the love expressed by Jesus' death. We praise you for raising him from the dead. We thank you for sending the Spirit to guide us in the way of Jesus. Deepen our faith, broaden our love for one another, and help us live to your praise and glory. This we ask through Jesus, Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Please stand. Let's sing together. seated. Good morning. It's nice to see everyone this morning, especially nice to see all the visitors here. Welcome. My name is Connie Stackhouse and I serve as a deacon here at St. Thomas. Here are some notes about upcoming services and activities here at the church. The Friendship Cafe opens right after the service. Please plan to join us for good refreshment and conversation. Right out that door, turn right, and then take the first left and you'll be down in Fellowship Hall. Morning Coffee meets this Tuesday in Fellowship Hall from 10 to 11 a.m. Stop in for snacks and conversation with friends from the church. I'd like to thank everybody who helped us to have a wonderful barbecue yesterday. We sold out by 12.30, however, we do have some potatoes left over. We have baked and unbaked potatoes and we're going to be selling them three for a dollar and they are huge baked potatoes. 
So please stop down to Fellowship Hall for that. The potatoes are going to be uh, three for a dollar. Also, if you have a cooler, we have a whole pile of coolers that have been scrubbed out and dried. If you brought a cooler yesterday, please take it home with you this afternoon. Laura Gifford has a word for us. I'm here today on behalf of our history committee. Um, we are turning our Heritage Sunday around. Rather than we looking backwards for our history in, in distance and thinking about that, we're going to ask you to help us preserve some history about what we the years we've just been going through. Um, in years past, we have gone through all of our minutes, and oddly enough, there is no mention of anything going on special during World War I or World War II. Uh, that we know that they must have been ha have, having things going on within the church, but no one recorded them. So what we're going to do is we are going to ask um, everyone who is willing to participate to Give us your stories of how you worshiped during the years of COVID. So next week, um, when we're having our wonderful, uh, there is an Easter brunch, right? Yes, yes brunch. We will be laying out um, thing, papers on which you can write or just illustrate what your time during COVID worship was. So there will be cutouts of um, papers that you can use. You can bring in your own information. We're going to compile all of it into a rolled document and that can be used later on for people who um, might be interested to know, well, you know, 50 years from now, how, what exactly happened during COVID. And I hope to see you all there. Thank you. And speaking of the wonderful heritage the church has and our recent past with COVID, in two weeks on Wednesday the 12th, that's the Wednesday after Easter, Reverend Carrie Call, who is our Penn Central Conference minister, will be here speaking to all of the consistory and also we'd like to invite the entire congregation. She spoke several weeks ago to the adult forum Sunday school class and she had some wonderful, wonderful things saying as to what the future of this church and churches in general hold. And she has a number of ideas that I think you would like to come and hear as we think about planning for the future of this church as well as other churches in our community. There's information in the bulletin about the upcoming Holy Week services. Thursday evening, there will be a live reenactment of the Last Supper it will include a Seder dinner, as well as the communion elements, the choir will be singing. And then on Friday, we're having the sort of quiet Good Friday service. And then of course, Easter morning, we have a resurrection service. And as Laura said, we do have a breakfast that starts at 7.30 a.m. It's before the service. So please take a bulletin home with you and mark your calendars for these events. Please stand. So this recognition of Jesus as king, this was something that would develop through the gospels and on into the work of the apostles as they went around preaching and teaching themselves about the ministry of Jesus. And we'll see references to him as king scattered throughout the letters and even in the book of Revelation. But one of those is offered by the Apostle Paul, and this sounds like a good place for us to wind up this morning's service. When Paul says this to his friend Timothy, now, to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, it's a great saying, right? 
But when he says that to the king be honor and glory forever and ever, he's basically saying, Timothy, that's up to you to give him honor and glory. And to do that, you need to figure out what it will take to give the Lord honor and glory, to live in a way that honors the Lord, to live in a way that redounds to the glory of God. That's what he's calling Timothy to. And we can hear that ourselves this morning for our benediction. To the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And then Paul says, not unexpectedly, amen. So be it. We agree. Amen? Amen. Amen.